In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As you heard the scripture lesson from Acts read previously, and indeed on all the Sundays after Easter, before Pentecost, you may have been struck that Acts is substituting for the more familiar Old Testament lesson, which is usually the first reading of the scriptures. This is to establish a new statement of Christian origins, a new foundation for our faith to which we look. And we read them and hear them because this is to be who we are. A couple of years ago, I paid for everyone in my family to spit in a cup and send it off to Ancestry.com. Then we waited expectantly for the report back. We were not surprised to see all of the elements of Germanic influences with a touch of Scandinavia. Since then, I fancied something impossible. We would all gather between the services at adult forum, and we would have a cup that we would pass around, and everyone would spit in the cup, and then we would send it off to Ancestry.com, <laughs> or maybe the ELCA headquarters in Chicago. And then on Pentecost, the results would come back and we would see our origins, our illustrious ancestors, and we would say to ourselves, this is where we've been, and this is where we're going. So for Christians who sail, and the church is often called a ship, for Christians who sail, our pole star for celestial navigation should be the remarkable stories in the book of Acts, especially about the first Pentecost and Paul and Peter. And now under the Holy Spirit's direction, the early Christian movement went public across the entire Mediterranean world. Before I let this slip by, one more thing, Ancestry.com reveals a remarkable catalog of women, converts, and leaders. Isn't it interesting that all these names of women are still available to us in the book of Acts? And isn't it interesting that we've mostly forgotten all of them? Look at our family tree, we Christians. There's Mary, the mother of Jesus, who got a speaking part, a song, in Luke's Christmas story. There's Tabitha, called Dorcas. Like many women in this congregation, she sewed for the poor. And Peter once raised her from the dead when everyone in the community cried that she might be dying. There's Mary, the mother of Mark, and the founder of an early Christian house church. There's Rhoda, the servant girl who was so thrilled when she jumped up to answer the door, and it was Peter, just released from prison. There's Lydia, the first Christian convert from what we now call Europe, who made her living selling purple cloth. There was Damaris, get this, a member of an elite society of intellectuals. She of good company and intellectual conversation. No doubt today a frequent leader of the adult forum. <laughs> Thinking about all this, Paul wrote to the Galatians, there's no longer Jew or Greek. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male and female, for you are all in Christ. Jesus. That's a lot to forget. 
but the church has frequently managed to forget. I'm reminded of a story a couple years ago in the halls of Congress. Elizabeth Warren had something to say and was determined to use up more time than the male leadership was willing to grant her. Mitch McConnell found it necessary to censure her and added for good measure, even amidst the counsel of all these mansplainers, nevertheless, she persisted. Now to Paul, the first and most illustrious. If we're Catholic, I suppose we'd say Peter is the most illustrious, but we Lutherans would never yield Peter to Paul, yield, yield Paul to Peter. Damascus, even college students somehow know this. Damascus is the greatest conversion story in Christian history, maybe in the history of the world. People know it. Oh, you had a Damascus experience. I emphasize this because Lutherans do not specialize in conversion stories or altar calls. Most of us are cradle Lutherans. Now, we would welcome someone who had just converted Saturday while watching an evangelistic program on television and imagine such a person walking in the door on Sunday morning to be greeted, first of all, of course, by Sonia Miller. And when this person says to Sonia, who always knows what to say, I just got saved yesterday, and I'm here to spend my time, the rest of my life, among you Lutherans. Sonia couldn't think what to say. You don't meet that many people who have just gotten saved the day before. And yet our greatest figure in the New Testament, St. Paul, was saved, or we might say converted, on the road to Damascus. Saul, Acts says, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, carrying a letter from the Jerusalem high priest to take Christians prisoner and forcibly march them back to Jerusalem and possibly kill them there. That Saul, a light from heaven flashed. He fell off his horse. He became dumb. He couldn't see for three days. Who are you? Paul says. Saul, why do you persecute me? Jesus says. Who are you? I'm Jesus, whom you've been persecuting. Get up now and go into the city, and someone will meet you with further instructions. That person was Ananias, and Ananias, like good Jews, when God called, he said, here I am. And then he said, what are you asking of me? And God said, I want you to go to this Paul person who's waiting in a room, blind and dumb, waiting for you to come. Are you sure you mean Paul, Ananias said? You're aware of his reputation? Go to Paul and tell him my plans. Then there's today's foundational text. Paul has a vision. Come over to Macedonia, outside your comfort zone, and hear someone saying, come over and help us. Paul went straight to an encampment outside the gate where women's spiritual seekers gathered. Lydia, a businesswoman who sold purple cloth, was there. God told her to open her heart to Paul. She did. 
she was baptized. Then she said to Paul, Paul who later would unfortunately say, let the women keep silent. She said to Paul, come to my house. Yes, she prevailed and he came. Something else about Paul, our boy Luther, the greatest reformer in the history of Christianity, prized Paul as the greatest theologian in Christianity. And nobody loves Paul and Luther in combination, like Lutherans do. <laughs> Following Luther and Paul, we take theology and intellectual study seriously. We don't want pastors who preach Mickey Mouse sermons that sound like they never went to seminary or never learned how to do sophisticated theology. Other churches have pastors like that. We teach the catechism. We prize it. Everybody's heard of Luther's small catechism. Some people even Luther's large catechism. We teach adult seekers before welcoming them into membership. We have regular adult forums and 40 to 50 people show up for them. Okay, I have to tell you this. In Chico, the church where I go, it's called Face Class. Faith, Adult, Christian, Education. <laughs> and uh, I was preaching a couple Sundays ago there and I was mourning the fact that a miserably small number of people turn out for these face classes. And this has been a persistent problem. And so I said, possibly slightly exaggerating, I know of a church in Gig Harbor, Washington that has the equivalent of a face class, although they call it adult forum, and 40 to 50 people show up. Is that true lately? <laughs> Could be a little fewer. But following Luther and Paul, we do try to take theology seriously. And then there's Peter. The prevailing culture tried to prevail on Peter. And when they said, don't preach in public, Peter said, we must obey God rather than men. Which reminded me of a story that happened to me. When I was just finished with my first year of seminary, there was an opportunity to go to Birmingham, Alabama and be an intern while their pastor went to St. Louis to do um, a study tour. They were very nice to me there. And I stayed with an extraordinarily good Christian family who themselves had a boy in seminary. But funny things happened. I was going on and on about black ladies one day and she took me aside and said, we don't call them ladies. We call them women. Women is good enough. Only white women are ladies. We also had a janitor who was black and we kindly welcomed him to our services as long as he sat in the balcony. And on the last Sunday in August when I was preaching my farewell sermon before returning for my second year at seminary, the text was from Acts 20, and a preacher gets up and says, we never shrank from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. It convicted me. I didn't feel I could avoid commenting on the whole counsel of God. 
And so I talked about the struggles with white racism in Birmingham. And when it was over, and the church secretary whom, with whom I had become buddies during that summer, declined to shake my hand and said, you just had to do it, didn't you? You had to insult us before going back north. Do we ever face such things here in the North, in Gig Harbor? I tried to imagine, because I used to think this about Agnes Day, I tried to imagine that we could have a big bell outside, but we don't have a big bell outside because the city might not like bells. And I once heard that we would have a bigger sign facing the street but we may not because the city does not wish to have large religious signs intruding on it. And that reminded me of a far worse example, and I'm not in any way comparing Nazi Germany to Gig Harbor, Washington. But there's a famous book called Lest Innocent Blood Be Shed, and many of us teach it in our Christian ethics courses. And it was a small village in uh, southern France during the Vichy government. And these were all Huguenots, which is to say Protestants who had been persecuted for several hundred years since the Reformation. And uh, kings in France had regularly uh, deported all the Huguenots and sent them north into Holland. But this group had stayed there. They stayed there and they practiced being recalcitrant for 300 years. And when the compromised Vichy mayor came and said to them, raise the flag, they didn't raise the flag. And when he came and said, don't ring the bell, they rang the bell because they were accustomed to resisting encroachments on themselves. In case Peter didn't get the point, God gave him a vision. A sheet, a large sheet came down from heaven as Peter was lying in bed half asleep. And on this sheet was every manner of living thing including, of course, all the cultural and culinary dimensions that Jews themselves could not touch or eat. Pork and sea fish, and seafood. And God says to Peter, that's all mine. All those things are things that I created. And they're waiting for an invitation from you come into the house, come into our calling, come into our group. So these are the ancestors, Paul and Peter and all those women. And we're now to follow them. So I'm going to close with a meme, a metaphor that isn't customarily used in Christian theology, but it's quite common on Wall Street, an initial public offering, an IPO. So as you may know, an IPO <clears throat> occurs when uh, somebody feels uh, they have a hot stock by the tail and they'd like to sell it as widely as possible to compound its uh, power in the market and so they carefully prepare an IPO, an initial ad for their initial public offering, and they work on it very hard so that it would be convincing. And then they broadcast it everywhere, and they hope that thousands of people will say, whoa, what a stock, I'm buying in. And the more people who buy it in, the more the stock grows and becomes important. 
So I'm saying that Paul, and you don't need Wall Street for this, Paul took Christianity public. Remember, Christianity, uh, the earliest church were all Jews, almost all. And they were accustomed to rooting themselves in the covenant theology of the Old Testament. And now the question is, are they going to be burdened with this ethnocentric understanding of God while taking it across the Mediterranean? It wouldn't work. And so Paul sees the light and goes public. He took Christianity public. Elon Musk is right now trying to take Twitter private, so he controls it exclusively. But Paul took Christianity public. So I close with this. The pastor and the council convene a series of meetings with the, the forum, the adult forum, and the purpose is to draft our IPO. So to draft a statement of who we are and what we mean to be in Gig Harbor. This slips out. People down in the harbor by the water are looking up the hill and say, those people up there, I think they're followers of Paul and Peter and Luther and Bach. Could be interesting. We will go further. We will bless all of Harbor Hill. We will take ourselves public and the whole town from Anthony's to Costco with trolley stops all along the way. Eventually, word will even reach the King Peninsula, the Key Peninsula. Amen.